Welcome everyone to the special edition of Kiwi Talks. I am speaking to a great video game poser, a composer who's composed for GoldenEye, Time Splitters, Blast Corps, Killer Instinct, and more. Graham Norgate, how you doing? Very well. Thank you for having me. Yep, I do like your little setup. It's, um, I just moved this a little bit. It's very basic. There's a just a just a little keyboard, and, and everything's in software these days. <laughs> it is. It is. It's, it's different from the racks. Of, well, I, well, I say that. Um, uh, the modular crew have got racks of gear still, but um, uh, that's that's not something I've dipped my toes in because it's uh, it's very addictive. Once you start buying these little units that that go bing you want to buy another one that goes bong and before you know it your whole room is just covered in stuff but yeah has your wake of composing changed from the old days at, at rare to now or is it largely the same um it's i well i i think sub uh subconsciously it has um i mean in in my t- to my mind i just do the same as I've always done. I sit down at Cubase and, and write some music. But um, if I go back to the stuff, say, 10 years or, Christ, 20 years, uh, and listen to it again, I think I, I, I'd, never write, I'd never write that uh, the way I'd write today, if that makes any sense. I think you, you just uh, you change over, over time. Um, um, but uh, the, the sort of the day-to-day structure of how I do stuff, more or less the same. Mm. Um, but but what comes out the other end is different. So when you say you've changed in terms of how you're writing, are you talking about like the production in terms of like it, it, when you're on a keyboard and how you're composing, or how how you go about um, building layers? Well, the production changes. Like I, I I had recently was looking at some older stuff, and I just I'd never. I'd never do that today. And so sort of production, the way I produce stuff has, has improved, but it's, that's not all. I mean, that's, that doesn't say you, you write better tunes. It's um, uh, the end result is what counts, but um, I don't know. You, your, your work processes change over time, I, I think. And um, uh yeah, I, I don't know. It's sometimes I can't even remember writing stuff. So you know, when you when you go back to it, it's like I I, I don't even know why, how I did this or why I did it or whatever. But um, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I suppose the, don't dwell on the past is probably <laughs> the best thing. Yeah, yeah. Because how did you end up at Rear? Because I think I read somewhere that you used to work at a bank. Yeah, I, um, I I was doing office jobs um, from when I'd left school, um, but with a, an eye to to write music. Well, I, I wouldn't say professionally at the time. I just wanted to do anything that wasn't working in a bank and involved music. Um, and uh, just six short years later, <laughs> I saw an advert for a, mus- a musician position at Rare. And um, in that time, I'd basically been writing music and self-teaching myself, I suppose. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, it was just pure luck. I was, I was in a, uh, a shared house at the time and reading through their copy. One, one of the guys who was living there, I was reading through his copy of Edge. And uh, it was just an, you know, the ma- in the days of the magazines, you'd have the adverts at the back and it said, it just had this very, very um, average looking advert saying rare designs on the future. Um, send, you know, we were looking for musicians and, and I think they were looking for animators and stuff. And at the time, so I'm very old school. So I go back to the eight bit days of com- home computing uh, in the UK, which would have been, the ZX Spectrum and the Commodore 64 and the, 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 the best games back then were made by a company called Ultimate Play the Game who had changed their name to Rare and I, I didn't even realise that, that that at the time. Um, 
but I was, I mean, you know, not, no, no offense to Reb, I was shooting off demo tapes to anyone who was asking for them. <laughs> so um, it was just a stroke of luck that that was the one that came through. And the first day I got there, they had, um, they had pictures of all the games they'd worked on all over the um, offices. And, you know, they'd done tons as rare as for the NES, because that was kind of when they were really producing so many games in a year. Mm. But then they had all the ultimate ones. And I was thinking, oh, my God, this is ultimate play the game. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, it's like the, you know, it's like your, your fanboy company uh, as a kid or something. Um, yeah, so that was good. But, but oh, um, the Stampers, they didn't really talk about the old days. I think they were very much focused on, they had designs on the future. Mm-hmm. So they're very, very much focused on, you know, the, the now and the future. They weren't, it's a shame because I'd love to have, have asked them about those, those days when they were in there. There was only a handful of them and they were making these, these eight bit computer games and stuff, but, um, oh, well, there you go. You're not still in contact with them? You could probably ask them now, surely. Or <laughs> <No. laughs> they probably, well, they probably get asked that all the time, I'd imagine. So some people don't yeah, they, talking about they, the they, they, They've always kept themselves to themselves and um, uh, they, they still, they're still busy working away at, at stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not the type of guys that will, you know, wax lyrical about the good old days or the old days at least. So. Yeah, yeah. So how did um, they decide who got what game in terms of composing? Because there was a number of composers at one stage. I mean, I know you yep. you and Grant handled GoldenEye, but I I understand that you were put on first and then you were running out of time, so you asked Grant to help you out. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was... So I was, um, I was doing several games at once, um, so let me think that would have been sort of 95 ish when I started summer 95. So I was doing that. I was doing blast core. I was also doing killer instinct two on the super Nintendo, which, which in the end was canceled, but it was still another title. Um, I think that was it. I might have been doing, Donkey Kong Land on the Game Boy at that in the summer of '95. I'm not sure, but anyway, I was fairly busy. Uh, so yeah, I I asked Grant to help me out because um, uh, the deadline for Goldeneye at that time probably would have been um, the end of the year '95. But as we know, you know that game got delayed over and over again, and, and as as is, is often the case but um as to who got onto the teams um it was it was pretty much down to sort of the lead designer of of each team really um there wasn't sort of a an overlord saying well he'll work on that and he'll work on that and she'll do this um so if you had a, a good working relationship with someone and they you know, liked your stuff and and and, and uh, could get on well with you, then you generally stay with that with that team. Um, so, for instance, um, I worked on Blast Core, and then that team went on to do Jet Force Gemini. So I started on on that game for a bit as well. And um, you know, so Grant would have worked on whatever the banjo we call it, you know, the, I think that the banjo team went on to do grab by the ghoulies. They, they would have done some other games in between, but you know, you'll have to excuse my memory, but um, no, it's, it's like, um, it's not saying it's the same type of thing, but it's like with films where you get a director who works with the same composer or the same actors and, and that kind of thing. It's, it's like a, you know, they know how to get along, I suppose, and um, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking of um, you know, sort of Tim Burton. Yeah, you know, he he often has the same sort of group of characters and uh, actors. Sorry, and 
so, composers and stuff. So how would you set out your day then? So if you're working on multiple games at once, would you say, mm. I don't know, allocate the morning to Blast Corpse and then GoldenEye in the afternoon? Or would you work on one game per day in terms of the soundtrack and then go um, from there? Well, the, in, the, way I, the way I work, I, I, sort of, I need to um, focus on what I'm doing and switch in between projects in quite quickly is, is not very good for the way I work. So, you know, cause you're, you're absorbing all this information about what's going on with the game and what kind of locations they have and all this sort of stuff. And, um, there's, there's so many things going around in your head that to, to quickly switch between projects, I, I don't think you, you'd get the best out, best work, um, mm. that you could out of it. So I used to go by weeks. So I'd say, well, okay, this oh. week is, is going to be for Blascor and the next week is going to be for Goldeneye. But also, <clears throat> it, uh, because uh, both of those games, well, when I first started on those games, it was fairly early days in the, uh, uh, the, sort of the cycle of, the, of the, the, what was now then called the N64. We didn't have final hardware or anything. So there's a lot of like finger in the air sort of, well, we think we can do this and we think it's going to be able to do this. So I would go and see the teams and see where they were and whichever was the furthest ahead, I'd, I'd work for them for a bit to catch up. And then I'd go and see the other teams and go, well, what, what's new? What have you got going on? And then if they didn't have anything, I could stick with the project that was on. If they had a lot of new stuff going on, I could switch and catch up with them. So, mm. um, yeah, it was it was a little bit sort of flying by the seat of your pants, really seeing <laughs> seeing what to what's the the best the best way to work around. So with with Goldeneye, because obviously you were taking the same thing and you're constantly remixing it. Did it ever get yep. monotonous, or were you always thinking of creative ways to do it? Uh, well, with that game, we did. Um, I don't know if I could do it again. <laughs> but, um, the, the, the Bond theme has got so many, so many different hooks to play with. I mean, you know, and they're all instantly recognisable. You, you, yeah. you could just take the brass tabs and bang, that's, yep. that's your theme right there. Or the bass, you know, the bass progression. Or, or the uh, guitar part, you know, there's all those little parts, you don't have to use them all in one tune, but just a, a nod to it and you, you know, half your work's already done. Um, I mean, that was the beauty of that game because um, it really was, the hard work was, was done before we even started on it yeah. because, of that, because of that theme tune. Um, one, of the, one of your most creative remixes of it, I thought was the Egyptian Temple, which I think is like the second the second secret level because it has yeah, like a middle yeah. eastern you made it middle eastern in terms of the vibe of it was that always the plan when you did it can you even remember that far back <laughs> <laughs> i can I, I, now i can remember because those those levels were fairly late on um and um i think i was sort of getting used to my sort of composer chops by by that point mm. um and and we by the end of the project, I, I knew more of more of what the hardware was c c was capable of. So you could you could get more tricks out of it and and, and sort of push it a little bit further. Um, I don't know. I, it's sort of Aztec. I, it, I always say that Aztec and Egyptian tunes. I seem to do those with every game I ever make. There's always like a some kind of far you. Know, uh, exotic level or something. Um, yeah. And uh, no, I I don't know. I like most things. I I just wrote it and it happened. <laughs> like I don't. There's never really a big idea again. Uh, um, so do you just sit it, there with, with like a keyboard and then you just jam, or do you come up with an idea in your head and then play it through the keyboard? Is that what you do? Generally, it's it's um, noodling at a keyboard. Um, mostly because 
ideas well I, ideas come to me when i'm not working which is a weird thing to say but um i think a lot of creative people have that have that same kind of um uh working practice you know you'll be somewhere completely different doing something you know i don't know you'll be out walking or you'll be standing on a train platform somewhere and you go oh that would be a great idea for such and such and um and some some ideas have come to me that way and and they've been great but generally you don't have that luxury because you're you're doing a a nine to five job so Mm. it's just sitting down at the keyboard and and working away until something pops up. Because you do sound design. Did you design that? What, what, I don't even know what you call it, like an, that atmospheric type of pipe sound in Goldeneye. No, that was that was Grant. So he he had a particular sound module. module. Uh, I think it was. I think it's a Proteus FX. It's just like a little slim box full of stuff, and he found out that by pitching some of these sounds down, you've got this Eric Serra type sounds that he used in a lot of his um, compositions. I mean, Eric Serra had quite a, uh, some signature sounds that he used in his uh, um, films in the nineties, which he also went on to, to use again for Goldeneye. Mm. So um, no, that's, 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 that's one of the grants, but, yeah, the, the, the amount of times that people have contacted us saying, how did you do it? Where did it come from? Well, it's <laughs> so iconic, that, that sound. Uh, you know, I think in, on almost every track in that game, it's used. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the, it, that was one of... The, so, so the limitations of the hardware meant that um, we, we had to work with quite a a small bank of sounds, which I probably in, in a way worked in our favor because it did make a lot of those sounds iconic because they, you know, we'd have to reuse them, but it also, it gave it some sort of glue. The, all the tracks had some sort of glue to, to work together. Cause if we'd had <clears throat> 10 times the memory or modern day sort of hardware, I don't think we would have worked that way. I think, especially with two composers, we would have um, worked on our own pieces with our own set of sounds and and then thrown them in at the end. And I don't think they would have worked as well together. Mm. But because we had, we were restricted. We we made these sounds that then both of us had to use. So I think that's um, that's that's one of the key elements of it. Well, it's synonymous with that game. I mean, even if I hear that sound and something else, I, I remember listening to David Wise's um, soundtrack for Tropical Freeze, and there's a track where he uses that pipe, and it just made right. me think of Goldeneye. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's it's definitely iconic. Uh, how was your time working on Killer Instinct? Because uh, obviously you worked with Robin Beanland on it, and I think he did a yep. bulk of it, but you did... Did you do four tracks? I think you did four or five tracks on yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, so that was our first game um, when, we, when, when we both started at Rare. Um, and yeah, that was, that was fun because uh, that was a good, that was sort of like a good leg up into the industry because um, it was completely different hardware to what the other guys were working. So Dave was, was doing, Dave and Evelyn were doing Donkey Kong Country and they were struggling. Well, no, that's, that's, that's a bad way to put it. They were having to get the best out of a tiny amount of memory. Mm. You know, like it was, it's um, no, no fun working on the snares. If, you know, if you, uh, you had to really work at it to, to get the best out of it. And, and and then we come in, like, br- just breeze in, and uh, and they're like, yeah, you can you know work on this arcade machine. It's like brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we. I, it's a shame. There's well, no, it's probably not a shame actually. There should be a um, uh, a reject soundtrack because the game designer was 
uh, I, I wouldn't say fussy, but he knew what he knew what he wanted, but he he couldn't quite put it into words all the time. So you'd come up with an idea and he'd listen to it and go, oh, no, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. And so we'd go back and, and, and try again and try again. And um, I'm, I'm sure Robin's mentioned this or he'll, he'll tell you if you ever speak to him for the, for the sort of the character select. I think he wrote over 50 tunes for that. Really? Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh I wrote God. four. I wrote four at the beginning and and uh, then Robin did some and he just kept coming back and he kept writing them. And um, yeah, th- there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of basement tapes for that game. <laughs> yeah. Cause uh, I, l- let me check if I got this right. So you wrote, I think, Folgor, J. Joe, yep. Thunder and Glacius. Is that right? Yes, I think so. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so Robin did the rest, um, six or seven tracks or something. So, so yeah, the first year, although it was, although my output was four tracks, I, I'd written over sixty pieces of music, and um, it was like, yeah, it's not quite right. I've, you know, for Thunder, I think there was at least twelve versions. <laughs> really? Yeah. Doesn't it get to yeah. a point where you're like, ah, oh, I'm over this? Like doing that because was um, it well when you're writing the pieces for Thunder, are you kind of hmm. still taking the original melody and then tweaking it, or are you just tossing it out and then going and starting from I, scratch I, again? You you do that a couple of times, and then by the <laughs> third time, when it's like no, no, it's not right. You just right get rid of everything, start again. Yeah. Um, I I don't I I think it's the case of we were all this was all our first game. Uh, game designer included and um, you don't I mean I don't know it's it's, that wouldn't happen now because you know we've all got experience and and sort of acquired knowledge and so if someone gives you a brief no matter how how scant on, on information you can more or less get to what they want and and also i there's with age you're more confident with um uh having that conversation with someone i mean before i probably i mean i was very young it was my first job i would have just done what i've what i'm told and also sort of not i wouldn't have um opened up a conversation say well okay well what do you mean by this and and what do you actually want and do you have any any examples i would have gone yeah okay gone home gone gone back to my office written what i thought he meant taking it in and you know missed the mark or something so do you i think we all sorry what are we gonna sorry. say no I, I think we all suffered from sort of just being you know rookies really at that at that point hmm. do you remember how you composed those tracks these days because like, they're all very, very different. And I suppose that's one of the good things about fighting games is you can kind of be more free, I suppose, in terms of how you construct a yeah. soundtrack as opposed to, say, yeah, I, a cinematic game where you have to make it all cinematic and it has to sound similar. Yeah, I mean, they were um, very much based on the location. And um, oh, I mean, I see. You know, that, so... Uh, yeah, I think that was that was it. And um, like I said, it was our first game. Myself and Robin didn't really sit down and, and talk much about how you know how it should sound or anything. We just went off and and did what we thought would suit that location. Mm. Um, and um, without really thinking any more than that, really, um, I, especially. Um, how to then get that soundtrack onto a console, which we didn't know at the time. But it, this was all what we were doing was always going to be what was we were led to believe that what was inside that arcade cabinet was going to be the N64 or Ultra 64, as it was known at the time. So, you know, didn't give it another moment's thought. And then when the N64 was delayed, Rare thought, right, okay, well, 
what can we do in the meantime? We can uh, convert the game to the Super Nintendo. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was a that was a, a, a fun project. <laughs> Just try and squeeze these, you know, sort of uh, big productions into sort of. 40 kilobytes or something <laughs> yeah because how you wrote the themes they were quite they're quite long and particularly in those days and then you obviously you had to compress them or condense them down into like one minute loops mm. what's what yeah. you pretty much have to do did you hear um obviously the new edition of killer instinct and mick gordon's remixed a lot of the the soundtrack he did he did a very good one of your jjo theme i thought Oh, right. Okay. I, I haven't actually heard it. I should, I, I'm ashamed to say I don't have an Xbox, so I've never oh, played it. I don't have it, one either. To... I just listened to the soundtrack because it's, it's right. good and I'm, I'm a big fan of Mick Gordon and I knew he was remixing a lot of your old themes as well. And I yeah. Was, I was, yeah, I, I, I was quite surprised. I was like, oh, he, he really did them justice, I thought. I, I, I'll have to check those out because um, I, I, yeah, I, I forgot about I forgot that all that was done because they brought it back, didn't they? So yeah, it's be quite a while, quite a while now. But yeah, he, yeah. he did a very, very good job, I thought, and he's still playing homage to you and to Robin as well. Which I cool. Thought, well, well, I would definitely check those out. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, he's he's an amazing composer. I'm sure he did a good job with them. Oh yeah, he's cool. he's great. I think he's one of the best in terms of the modern era mm, for sure. Mm. What's your relationship like with Robin these days? Because he's still at Rear, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's he's still there. I think a veteran um, now. He certainly is. That there's not many that have been there longer than him. I mean, there are some some a few that have been there longer, but uh, I think he's been there 26 years because <laughs> we started on the same day, um, all those years ago. Um, up until the pandemic, we would see each other fairly regularly i mean you know, as as you get older and family happens you you don't quite see each other as much as as you would have done but i'd still see him a few times a year and and catch up with him and if grant came over from the states you know we'd all get together and that's it's it's really nice because i mean uh although we only worked together for like just over five years it's it's those formative years when you're young and you know time time takes longer than it does now so you know those bonds last and um you just pick pick up where you left off really well it seems like there's a good camaraderie between all of you all of the components yeah, I, we, yeah regardless it, we, of was, who's there and who isn't yeah no it's it's um it was a it was a a, a good time to work there um I mean, it, there was definitely competition between the teams. I was going to ask you that. Um, yeah, yeah. I would imagine it'd be the, quite competitive between multiple composers, particularly if you'd hear someone else's work and be like, uh. uh well, it wasn't nasty competitive. There was uh, the, the, the audio guys got on well together, but, you know, you'd always, you'd, you'd see what the other games were doing and, and it, it kept you on your toes mm. um and and you learn you learned a lot as well because it was you know people coming from different backgrounds and um approaching problems in different ways and yeah i i learned so much in my time there just from you know um having all that sort of combined uh, information that was um available Mm. Um, I mean, Robin's musicality is, is amazing. He, he, he was instrumental in helping me figure out the bond chords um, because you know, it's, it's weird looking back. Well, it's not that weird, but you know, back then there was no internet really. Not that I, I didn't, not that I was aware of. There was no YouTube tutorials or, you know, I'll oh, just download the MIDI file. You, you were listening to these, these tracks played by these old, you know, 60s jazz guys. <laughs> going, I just can't work these chords out. It's insane. And Robin would stand there listening. He goes, no, there's, there's a G in there. There's a G in there definitely or something, you know. And, yeah. and he'd help me figure these chords out. 
Um, awesome. But no, it's 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 so much easier now. You know, there's there's going to be someone on YouTube that's done a tutorial about anything you want to do ever. You know? Pretty much, so, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So, what was your time like working on Time Splitters and Perfect Dark? Because those are a bit more, I'd say, I suppose darker games, a lot more ambient, yeah. sci-fi. Yeah. In Perfect Dark's case. Yeah. And time Splitters um, as well. well yeah. So, yeah, that's an odd one. So Perfect Dark was obviously still at Rare. And I, I suppose I, I was on that for about a year and a half before I left to go, to, uh, go on with, uh, to, go to Free Radical. Um, yeah, it was... I, um, I suppose it was taking what we'd learned from Gold Knight from a technical point of view and then making it better basically because we were learning as we were going along making golden eye and um and then when we had a chance to do it again but sort of with original pieces um there was more flexibility and um and yeah i suppose you, sort of, you, all those tricks that you'd learned with the previous project were already there so you could you could bring those along um but i mean grant did the bulk of the work on perfect dark because he he took over when i left yeah because um, i don't actually know what he composed and what you composed i know you have a credits list on your facebook page for golden eye but i don't actually yeah, know the credits i don't, the, uh, for, honest, I, don't I don't know the, the final titles because mine were just working titles um so I know I had a piece called Up Yours. <laughs> and I can't, I can't remember, I can't remember the, the level it ended up on. Um, yeah, my, my working titles were all pretty uh, stupid. Um, do, you so, still, do you still have that way of working now, your working titles? Do you still use uh, that, that? Not so much now because, that, cause I'm, cause I, that was a, working on a game that was so far off being complete that um, it was more or less just a case of um, writing tunes for the levels, but I don't don't think even the levels had their own, their final titles or anything like that. Um, nowadays, I'm very much sort of at the other end where the, everything's ready and I need to to write something quickly. So, you know, there's, there's no mucking around anymore um, on that front. Time split as though... Uh, yeah, I I don't know. I wouldn't say it was darker. I mean, it, again, it it very much like the fighting games. Um, it was based on location, mm. um, so it was great for me because you know, I, I, I've got I got a, I'm, I'm terrible at sticking to the same thing for very long. So having that whole universe of of things to write. So you know, one one minute you're in a you're on a martian planet the next minute you're in a, a supermarket mall or something you know that was great because um i could basically i had a list of the levels and the, and the guys were working on them i could work on whatever i fancied at the time you know it was um quite a free experience to do that mm. and it also gave me a lot of time to research um i've been asked a few times like well how did you do the music for such and such and i was thinking i said well this isn't going to be relevant to you but i used to make a playlist on a cassette and listen to it in my car going to work and coming home for for weeks just to get diff you know get that kind of music into my head um so for instance the there's a big band tune time splitters 2 i didn't know anything about that and again you know, it was it was before the days of Spotify, where everything, every piece of music was just a, a Google search. So I, you know, I'd, I'd go off to record shops and actually buy CDs and stuff like that, and then make a compilation and just listen to it. Right, okay, well they do that and they do this, and you know, um, but I had the luxury of time. I think um, you know, if it was a, if I was um, 
freelancing and I was just given a, a list of 20 tunes to write as soon as possible, I, I, the results would be completely different. Um, it's the luxury of being in-house. Yeah. When you worked at, um, ended up at Crytek, uh, because you're an audio director, right? Mm. Is that, so what, what, what does that actually entail? What do you actually do as audio director? Do you just tell people to compose and do this and but, do that? Um, there was less in-house composition, composition going on at that point. It was, it was, so when I started, it was, it's all down to sort of um, hardware uh, um, limitations. So when I started at Rare, we were, basically composers but also did a few sounds on the side mm. so um it was never really seen as a um a job on it a job by itself and then as time progressed and uh new consoles came out with better memory and better hardware it became more of a serious um uh job and it continues to so you know the the role of what would then be called sound designers now splitting up. So you have dialogue directors who just deal with the speech and you'll have Foley recorders. You know, it's becoming more like a film and TV production. Um, in Crytek days, which would have been PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, you had a, a, fair, a fairly good amount of memory but you know, nowhere near what you would have now um so it was basically my my role to, to actually answer your question was overseeing what the team's team was doing and guide them in in any way i could um and working with uh freelance composers so you'd write the brief and um sort of critique what they uh, wrote and stuff like that. So, so it was um, less hands off. I mean, you'd still try and get into stuff, but you were you'd spend more time working with spreadsheets than you would with sounds. Which uh, you know, it's, it's a, well, a that funny way. Fun. <laughs> no, it's it's not a fun thing to do. And it's 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 often the way it works in the games industry. As as people progress, it's like, well, oh, you're really good at doing this, so why not do this something else that you don't want to do? And you, know, you may not have the skills to do. So like, yeah, brilliant. Um, I can spend all my day in meetings and talking about doing stuff when actually I'd be better off doing stuff. But you know, that's, that's the way of the world, unfortunately. And don't you get paid more when you're a director, when you're doing the stuff that you don't want to do? <laughs> I suppose that's the, yeah, that's how it works, isn't it? That's, that's paid the golden to, handcuffs. You pay, yeah, you get paid more to do stuff you don't want to do and get paid less to do the stuff you want to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah Funny how much. that works. Because <laughs> what, what are you doing these days? Um, so I'm working for a company called Lockwood Publishing. Um, and I'm basically writing more music than I've ever written before in my life. Um, it's a it's it's a live mobile app. Um, oh. It's like a like a virtual world, and they have two releases a week, so there's always new stuff coming in, and um, that's actually really good fun because it's going back to. Um, different locations it's like right okay we're going to have a space theme or we're going to have uh, you know, a, 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 I don't know a, an American American uh, mountains or something yeah I don't know I, just just every month it's going to be something different so I get to write music that's that's different from the last month and I'm back to back to where I was and that's that's fantastic because I don't have meetings all day. I don't have to look at spreadsheets. I just start in the morning, write some pe write some music and, and carry on. And uh, it's, it's really, it's really nice because, because um, as of probably Hayes when I was at Free Radical, which was 
um, 2005-ish, I think. Sort of, that was the game we did after Time Splitters Future Perfect. That was that was the first sort of step to. I don't actually have time to do any of the nice stuff. I'm just managing, and and it took a while to realise that you know what what I really like to do is is do the creative side. So take a step back from managing people and, and actually getting my hands dirty again. Hmm. Um, do you do you prefer routine as opposed to just letting the, the inspiration flow? I know when I spoke to Grant, he says that he doesn't really have a routine. He just kind of just composes whenever, you know, when the ideas come to him and he just does it. Whereas what I suppose what I'm asking is like, do you have a set time? Where it's like, okay, nine to five, I'm just going to compose. Not really. Um, I th- it's, and I, I, again, I'm, I'm not one of these people that will just sit there and wait for inspiration to hit, but um, it's, I, I'm not a, a methodical composer. I couldn't say, right, okay, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to do this, this and this and, and bang, there's the tune. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty slapped. <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, like I was saying right at the start, when I was look, when I look back at stuff from 10 years ago and I, I don't know how I did it. Um, I still don't really know. I couldn't write a, I couldn't write down to anyone. I mean, if someone contacted me and said, how do you write music? I couldn't tell you. It's, 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 um, it's, it, it sort of just happens. And, um, yeah, there's theory to back stuff up. There's so, you know, I can be sat at a keyboard, get a melody or get a chord progression. And then you can use your theory to then work out, you know, well, okay, it's going to need a bass line. It's going to need a string part or something like that. And, you know, that's, that's when it's, it's less creative, I suppose, because it's, it's learnt um, knowledge, mm. but um I couldn't tell you how I'm going to sit down tomorrow morning and write this piece I need to write. I don't know where it will start. I mean, it, I, it, it could, yeah, it could be just, um, you play on the piano and think, right. Okay. Well that, that's, let's try that. And let's put some chords to that and see what happens. And once you've got that idea, it's fairly quick to then build on it. And then you can, faff around for days on end just sort of tweaking something like oh i don't know i'm going to just change that snare a little bit and, and you know it's the it's the remaining five percent that nobody cares about <laughs> but, you know, well unless you're like a you, full-on sound nut which you pick up like every single little minuscule detail yeah yeah i mean i'm not a i'm i'm not an engineer by by craft and you know you, you can I've been in studios where the guy's there just, he's just messing with, a, like I said, like a snare drum for 10 hours or something. It's like, what are you trying to do? Like, <laughs> what are you hearing that I can't hear? Um, but yeah, you know, that's, it's, we all work different ways. Um, yeah. Do you ever get writer's block? Do you yeah. ever just, ah, yeah. Oh, I've absolutely. It, it's frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, I, I've I've got the worst imposter syndrome in the world, um, and I'll get periods of time when I I don't know I don't I, I don't really call it writer's block. It's just my mojo's gone or something like that. Like if I've if I've written a lot of music in a short space of time or or over a long space of time, there comes a point when you know you just you're just going through the motions. I, I think, and you need to take a break. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think everyone has to do that uh, who's, who works in a creative field. Mm. Um, because if you don't let your brain have a, a break and get some, you know, have some breathing space, you're, you're just going to do what you've done before because you, you've, you're becoming a sort of machine or something. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I've certainly had periods of usually after a long project when you've put everything into getting it out the door and you just, you know, you're burnt out is a strong term, but you know, you certainly have that kind of period where you need to recharge for a little bit. Um, I did, I did think I was, I had 
terrible writer's block when it was at Rare. And then looking back to it, I was looking back at that period. I, I was writing tons of music. I just, I just didn't like any of it. You know? So was, I was, <laughs> was that due to the expectations maybe or comparisons? I mean, and you guys were at that time, I remember with Rare as you guys were like considered, you know, the second tier next to Nintendo, like you were right up there. I mean, and mm. you, I suppose a lot of your, your composition work was probably getting compared to Koji Kondo and those legends as well. Well, I, to, again, back then, it was pre-internet days and we were, we were in such a microcosm living, not living, sorry, working at that studio in the middle of nowhere. We had no kind of outside influence or or comment. So I didn't have a clue that we were held in that high regard. We just did what we did. Well, that's kind of a good thing, isn't it? Cause yeah. I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I think what, what you're trying to say is if, if it's that fear of fear of failure when you're, when so much is expected, it's like, I, you know, I don't know where to start because what if it's not as good as everyone wants it to be? Um, but there was, I mean, I suppose the, the closest you would get would be a, a magazine review and, and magazines never mentioned audio. <laughs> you know, they might give you no, one. Oh, and it also had some music, which, which wasn't terrible or something, you know, it'd be like <laughs> at that level. Um, so, and I, I often, I say this to, to younger people these days when they release a game and they're constantly on, on the net looking for reviews. So don't go searching for it because you're not, going to like what you find because you'll keep searching until you find someone who's slagging you off you know and well, that's going to be yeah and that's going to be the one you remember you won't remember 99 people saying this is fantastic you'll remember the one person saying this is horrible you know that's yeah. that's human nature it's so true it's so true yeah. so no i back that then we i think it would have been awful if we had uh thought we were the bee's knees because you know if you're arrogant and big-headed then you you know you're, you're not going to do your best if you if you're just there we were in our little happy bubble competing with each other and trying to make the best games we could it was um you you know you're pretty safe i think is there a particular game you'd like to compose for if given the opportunity um well, if they do another time split, as I'd like to be asked. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fair enough. Um, no, I'm surprised I, they didn't ask you to, to help out on Killer Instinct, actually. Or did they? And I... No, no, they didn't. I, I, well, I think if anyone, they would have asked Robin. But yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's all down to schedules, isn't it? I mean, Robin would have been working at Rare Hard, you know, there's you can't drop everything and just, and just move on to another project. And, and I've, to, to be honest, I mean, I think it was a good decision to get um, a guy like Mick to bring a completely modern approach to it. And um, because if it had been given to me or Robin, I think we would have been, well, I'm speaking for myself. I can't speak for him at all. Um, but I think I would have been too aware of the previous tracks and nodding, giving too much of a nod to it. Um, because, you know, music, <laughs> a lot of music, just trying to be careful with my words, um, in certain genres, yeah, it doesn't age well or it, it's of a time. Well, you're not wrong, yeah. I mean, there's a lot no, of would, uh, video game music that's, probably a bit dated by yeah. these yeah i mean and, and it's not it's 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 like everything it's like when people say oh you know comedy is no, like this comedian from 30 years ago isn't funny anymore things move on tastes change and stuff and um yeah giving giving someone a completely fresh pair of eyes and ears on it i think was a, a good idea i mean um I'm sure there would have been some people that were upset and thought, oh, well, they should have given the original team members, you know, uh, a chance to work on it. But 
I think you know. I think the ultimately they did the right thing. Um, yeah, well, Mac thinking, definitely as, delivered. Yeah, yeah, and and I think you know he. Hey, it, hats off to the guy. He he obviously had um, some. You know, he had love for the original and and didn't want to just like you know. Oh, there you go. There's my tunes. Where's my Where's my check? Thanks very much. Move on to the next thing. He he really researched it and 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 took it you know to the modern day and um which which you know believe it or not that would that was me and robin back in the mid 90s that was modern at the time you know and yeah well he um, he so. went he went to tibet to g- learn how to do that throat singing the uh, uh, <laughs> just to do I for have, Jojo's I thing. That. <laughs> yeah, that's how extreme he goes. It's just flew all the way there to learn, and it's him. Like, oh, I might send you the link afterwards, but he's like, bleh, bleh. like I don't know how he does it, but um, yeah, like that's, he, that's great. That's brilliant. Yeah, have you ever done that? Gone to a particular country to like research a piece of music? No, uh, no, um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's no. extreme dedication. <laughs> Um, I, I think that rare, we, we, we didn't think that far afield. Um, and, um, that, that wasn't really a a thing at at free radical. We just didn't, we wouldn't have had the time to do that sort of stuff. Different, different different time period, right? Different. Yeah. yeah. In the industry. Um, When, at Crytek, the there was um, um, field trips to New York. Crytek, uh, sorry, Crisis Two was based in in New York, and Homefront was based in Philadelphia. So you know, people would go over there. But you know, I'm, what am I going to learn by going to Philadelphia? <laughs> the, the, the Philly, <laughs> the Philly sound of the seventies. <laughs> right, guys, I've got some great ideas. Get the brass band out. Um, <laughs> No, but no. Hats off for him doing that. That's amazing. <laughs> I suppose to to bet it's a little bit closer for him, but still, I mean, that is that's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's just it's just interesting to see uh, musicians and their different approaches to doing things. Mm. Mm. But you still you still stay in contact with uh, Grant and Robin and and all those guys, and you still listen to their work, I suppose. I um, I was talking to Grant on the show a couple of weeks back because I asked him. And I'll ask you as well: Is if if you'd be open be open be open to doing music for film? I've given the um, I I know that's what Grant does and wants to do. Um, personally, doesn't interest me at all. Doesn't interest you. Um, the only no, reason why um, I, the only reason why I ask is because sometimes there can be some crossover, hmm. uh, particularly if you're doing cinematic type music. Yeah. Um, no, it's, I, I, I mean, I've just, just uh, ruined my, my future chances now, haven't I, by saying that? But no, um, <laughs> I've only ever loved video games and that, is, that was my ambition as a small child. That's what I wanted to do. And um, yeah, film scores just don't interest me. I mean, I'm an, uh, you know, I'm an old... I, I'm an old guy and I, I like themes. And so I like those themes of um, John Williams and, you know, of the eighties and stuff, but um, I, yeah, I just, it doesn't do anything for me. And I, and at this point I'd rather, like I was saying earlier with the, you know, the audio director role where you're not actually doing anything particularly creative. I'd rather do, now at this age, I'd rather do stuff that I enjoy um and if you have love for something then you would pro- hopefully you produce something that's good um if you're doing something that you're just doing it for the paycheck then it's just a it's just a, a you know nine to five job and that's not what this is well, I, I do feel video games you have a bit more room to be more creative because it can vary greatly from game to game right whereas opposed oh. to opposed to working on a film where the soundtrack it, most soundtracks to films have a certain type of sound you know the more classical or orchestrated uh approach whereas yeah, you know, i mean, I'm, I, mean, that's I, mean not to say, this, I'm not saying that that the the palette of sounds pours. i mean there's some very original 
soundtracks out there. And some, oh, yeah, there are. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. But yeah, the sitting down with with a ninety minutes of of um, to 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 score it just isn't what I'm mm. what I get out of bed to do. And and more more power to those that want to do it. I know there's you know there's I, I I'd rather they have the opportunity <laughs> to do it. Yeah, know? but what I'm saying is, I mean, if if someone is to look at your resume in terms of all the the music you've done on various games, I mean, you can see mm. there's a lot of difference there. I mean, GoldenEye, the music there is completely different to Killer Instinct, and Killer Instinct's mm. different to Time Splitters, which is different to Blast Corps. You know, mm. so it's it's very very. I mean, as a musician myself, I can appreciate diversity. Because I know mm. a lot of musicians that kind of get stuck in their kind of that one sound sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think you know people with a. I I I. Uh, I'm sure people would would disagree, but I don't feel I have a style. And again, it's it's down to that boredom threshold of I just like doing new stuff all the time, mm. and. And I know f- films can be different styles, but um, with games, the turnaround's a lot quicker. So if I'm doing a mobile game, for instance, um, you know, it, I, I did one a couple of years ago, which was based on um, carnival, a carnival circus kind of theme. So there's a lot of waltzes and uh, you know, pipe organs and all that kind of stuff. And I loved doing that, but I loved it for six months and I, you know, or, or how wasn't that long, however long I worked on it. They were, you know, it was a handful of very f- fairly short tunes. And then I moved on. Um, I don't know. It's, 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 and having that control as well, I think with films, you are very much at the, at, at the whim of the director. And, you know, it's about, if you can't do what they want you to do, then you know none of you are going to have a, a fun time doing it. So that's exactly um, what Grant said. Right. You see, too many people try and fight with the director, and you know mm. don't do what they're told, and then they get fired. And he's just like, that's what happens. So, yeah, and and uh, I I think you know if. <sighs> to get on in that, in, in that industry. And, and I'm not saying I could even get into that industry because it's, it's, um, well, it's Grant's, completely unknown. Grant's having a hard time. I mean, and he's living in LA and yeah, I would, yeah, and think, he's, it, I would think with the resume that he has, that it would be easy, but mm. even he's having a hard time. And I was quite surprised when he was telling me and I was like, what? Yeah. So it's, just, it's, it's cutthroat. It's, it's fiercely competitive. Yeah, I I think it takes it uh, uh, maybe more so for a TV composer. I think it's a completely different way of thinking because um, as a film TV composer, you you're you more or less you're the you're the figurehead, and under that you have a team of people working for you. Um, so. Because you have to produce so much in so little time. I mean, think about, you know, an American TV drama series or something that has 22 episodes a year. How does one person do all that? Well, they don't. They have, you know, people, you give someone a sketch and go, right, take that, flesh it out. Or you have a, you know, your team of people that are orchestrating for you and, and doing all the recording, the live instruments and stuff. And, I think as video game composers, we're still very much of a, it's just a, a guy in a room doing everything. And until we realize that there's, you know, we ne- will need to branch out and have that support, it's still going to be looked upon by the film industry as a you know, sort of second cousin, I suppose. And I don't, mm. I don't agree with that because I think video game soundtracks have have uh, um progressed so much that yeah, we're 
almost on a par with them but yeah well i think it needs to happen i mean gaming grosses more per annum than television and film combined and it's not even close like it's mm. some ridiculous amount and it's only going up it's only increasing whereas mm. i know with film it's decreasing so it's i don't understand well it might take a while maybe it's the older generation some of them don't quite get video games i mean i know some people who are very anti esports and how it's not a sport and yeah but, yeah, yeah. It's, it will be it will be you're right it's a generation of thing i mean um not so long ago i was talking to someone who puts on musicals and um they not their fault but they had they really didn't have any idea about how soundtracks for games work they just couldn't you know put two and two together and figure out how how it happens because they're from a gener well their ge his generation was completely different to ours and and they have a way to do stuff they have a way of working in uh in musical theater which is completely baffling and different to the way i work so yeah we all have our little ways that we do stuff um and for someone to jump from one one medium to another i think is is quite it's quite unusual yeah it um, is, it is. um but no, I, I, I hope Grant gets there because he, that's what he wants to do. And, but he's a, you know, he's a great composer and he's a, he, he's a fast worker and that's what you need to be in that industry. So I think yeah, he, I, he would, he would, it would be suitable for, suited to, for him. He's lobbying to try and compose the, the Super Mario film, the, the, <laughs> the animated film. So, I mean, I, I tried to promote it. I tried to push it on social media and made like a petition and stuff to try and right. he can't, he's, he can't even get in contact with the people who are making it. He, well, he doesn't even know who's involved yet. And then he, mm. he's trying to just get to the director to just <laughs> hand him some music. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's hard. That, it's hard. Because, it it's, hard who you, because... it's who you know. It's not what you know. You can be the greatest yeah, exactly. composer, but, but unless you're exactly. connected with those people, like it doesn't matter. No, exactly. I mean, uh, there'll be 2,000 composers who are sending stuff to that director saying, can I work on your movie? Can I work on your movie? And the director's not going to sit down and listen to every one of those tracks. And, and you know, s some of them could be the best music in the world, but it's just a time thing. Yeah, so right. you're going to go with who you know. And it's like, well, you know, we worked with this person on this movie and or he's been recommended, she's been recommended. So... Um, and and you know, as anything with a large budget, everyone's going to be so risk averse. So anyone who's a safe pair of hands immediately is going to be you know a hundred times more likely to get the job than someone that hasn't hasn't had the experience and you know um, is just willing to give it a go. Um, so yeah, it's a very very difficult industry to get into is pro probably not as hard as sorry it's, it's probably not as hard to get into video games but to, to some it's still going to be a baffling closed shop you know yeah. um um i was lucky i i just was in the right place at the right time and um happened to to, to get to you know get get my foot in the door as it were but you know, there's there's other people that that they could be the best composer in the world, but they'll just never get to where they need to be because they're contacting companies who don't need anyone at the time. Or, you know, it's, it's just, um, you know, it's just that, that stroke of luck. Like if, if I'm, for instance, if I'm looking for a, a freelance composer to help out with a project, I'll, I'm going to look at the people that have contacted me in the last, you know, month or so i'm not going to go back into a filing cabinet somewhere and pull it oh, i remember 10 years ago some guy sent in this amazing track you know that must find it or whatever it's and you know that sucks to be that guy but it's the it's the way it is and i think you know times that by 10 100 for the film industry yeah cool graham well hey i'm gonna wrap up there this has been amazing chatting to you um if anyone That's wants if anyone wants to follow you on social media, what's was the best place to do that? 
Facebook? Um, I guess Facebook. I've got a composer page on there. Yeah. I hardly ever post to it, though. I got a Twitter page. I hardly ever post on that. That's I don't good, have though. LinkedIn. <laughs> good, because so. you don't get affected by the negativity that's always on social media, that, which is good. No, I, I look at Twitter, but I, I have a, a no Twitter the weekend rule because you know it's it's just it's just miserable. <laughs> so, but I'm out there. Just just put me in Google. There'll be something. Or just ask me if someone wants to ask me a question. They'll find me on Facebook or something. So. Yeah. For sure. Well, I'm, hey, not, I'm, not plug, I'm not plugging anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for doing this. I, I, I imagine you're a very busy guy. It's, so I, uh, it's been, it's been a it. pleasure. Yeah, you're yeah. welcome. Yeah, I look oh, forward really, to hearing um, more, more stuff from you, for sure. Cool. cool. All right. Well, that's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. And uh, until next time, stay safe.